Welcome to No News Is Good News. Today's top story. Racist MP Diane Abbott has been suspended for racism. Some breaking news. Britain's opposition Labour Party has suspended uh, MP Diane Abbott for suggesting that uh, Jewish people and travellers suffer from prejudice rather than racism. Oh, you better apologise for that, Diane Abbott. Abbott apologised. Oh, you have apologised. Oh, you have. OK, well, that's not enough. You've got to... But there's, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> Just fuck off. The Labour Party has, though, suspended her from the Parliamentary Labour Party pending an investigation. So the Labour Party are investigating Diane Abbott. Obviously, a full investigation is needed. We need to get to the bottom of this. You know, lots of DNA has to be sampled and witness witness reports, accounts. We've got to, we've got to look at the history. I mean, who is this woman, Diane Abbott? I've never heard of her before. We need some scrutiny. Where's she come from? What's her background? No one. I feel like there are some people in this country that just slide under the radar their whole lives and we have no idea who they are or who they convert with. The Labour Party has gone down this route and, and moved quite swiftly to suspend Ms Abbott while they investigate what is happening, uh, what, the, what was behind this letter. Quite, quite right. We need to investigate uh, w what is happening, <laughs> what is behind this letter. Thanks to Helen for that. Yeah, cheers, Helen. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have to say I was pretty hurt by Diane Abbott's remarks. Pretty, pretty disgraceful stuff, I thought. And, you know, particularly from someone like that who, who hasn't experienced the sort of racism that I've experienced my whole life. I'd, I'd like Diane Abbott to just for an hour, just walk in my shoes, see the kind of, I mean, you call it prejudice, but I mean, it is racism, right? The full on racism that I face on a daily basis. I'd like to sit Diane Abbott down and uh, do a sort of four hour anti-Semitism training, like really lecture her. They're going to get through to her about the sort of racism that I face. And she has no idea about. It's disgraceful. Speaking of anti-Semitism, Jonathan Friedland, not to be confused with Adam Friedland, wrote this disgusting article for The Guardian about a month ago. A bit of context for you before we get into this. So this channel, Complaints on a Plate, is now a pro-Israel channel. So, uh, you know, you better get used to that. that. That's how we are now. Why? Well, um, mostly because of what's been going on over the last few months. It's really exciting what's happening in Israel right now. But also, I think, um, you know, over the last few years, this channel has said, has said a few things about Israel here and there. And I've come to think that maybe... I, it wasn't really a view on Israel. I, I think maybe I would just had some deep-seated sort of self-hatred and anti-Semitism. And so I've grown. And uh, so now we're 100% behind the Israeli government and everything it's doing. Uh, so I was I was pretty disgusted when I, I saw the Jonathan Friedland article, which is uh, very critical of the Israeli government and, and uh, a little bit suspicious, I thought. Particularly when you think about the fact that, as I say, you know, the Labour Party has been hounded by allegations of anti-Semitism over the last few years. And yet, despite that, the left-wing Guardian newspaper still backed the Labour Party under Corbyn in the 2019 general election. Now, a journalist with any integrity would have resigned at that point, right? But Jonathan Friedland didn't. He stayed with the Guardian. And now he's writing highly critical articles about the Israeli government. Now, of course, criticism of Israel is fine. There's no problem with that. You can criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic. But is that what Jonathan Friedland's doing? Because I fear that some of the things he says in the article could be interpreted by some people as allusions to anti-Semitic tropes, maybe. So in the article he says, there is only so long a democracy can survive while ruling over another people. And I, I wonder, what is this other people that he thinks the country of Israel is ruling over? 
And then later, after describing what's happening in the Israeli government, he says, and I quote, A government with unlimited power, with no Supreme Court standing in its way, would face no obstacle if it moved towards theocracy, as some in the coalition wish. Oh, what kind of theocracy is that? Is he saying that Jews are going to take over Israel? Jews are going to control Israel as a Jewish state? As I say, you know, criticism of Israel is fine, but don't bring the Jews into it. But this is where it went too far for me. It's no use saying that the voters can simply kick Netanyahu out next time. If the Supreme Court is gutted, there will be nothing to stop him changing the electoral rules, say banning those parties he deems as a threat to national security. This is why Israelis have been on the streets. They understand that the only time to stop a dictatorship is when it's being established. If you wait, it's too late. So uh, why do the Israeli people believe that? Why do they understand that? Uh, are they drawing on lessons learned from history? And if so, which parts of history? When I think about some party that came to power was elected, but then changed electoral rules so that it became a dictatorship. Well, <laughs> one comes to mind, but you know, I'm not going to say it, obviously. And I don't think at all that it applies in Israel. Definitely not. That's the last place that that would apply. Friedland is, uh, he's left-wing through and through. He's part of the Guardian newspaper, very much involved in Labour Party politics. Um, left-wing nut job. And they're all obsessed with Israel. And so, you know, I, I would like to say to Starmer, you know, if we want to stamp out anti-Semitism. Obviously, Starmer, primarily, he's in control of the Labour Party. He's got to do that through the Labour Party. But he he's also wants to represent the country. He needs to call out anti-Semitism everywhere. When it's someone who's writing in a national newspaper supposedly on the left in support of Labour policies, he needs to call them out and say, you're not a friend of the Labour Party. So I'm hoping that Starmer will uh, publicly name and shame Jonathan Friedland. There are still those who think there's no problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, that it's all exaggerated or a factional attack. Then, frankly, you are part of the problem, too. Well, it's really fun being sport of Israel. It's like shooting Jews in a barrel. Speaking of Starmer, let's move on to the poster. Firstly, I think it's important to say, as a Labour member, I support the leader. Most Labour members were, were like sheep. When I joined the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn was the leader. Um, things have changed. We've got a new leader now, Keir Starmer, and I, I go with uh, <laughs> the leadership, as I say. So and I think Louise Ellman put it best when she said... People from the far left came into the party and started to dominate it. And some of those people brought with them conspiracy theories. And they somehow brought that into the culture of the Labour Party. And I think that's how it works, right? You have a sort of culture that's built up and, and the leadership is a strong part of that. And as a Labour member, I could tell you right now, the big thing is Islamophobia. That's the big thing in the Labour Party right now. I've, I've certainly become a lot more Islamophobic since Dharma has become leader. And that makes sense, right? Because obviously under Corbyn, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, which comes from his left-wing position. Starmer wants to bring the Labour Party back into the mainstream. The mainstream is very Islamophobic. And so you're going to see a fall in anti-Semitism, which we have, and a rise in Islamophobia. <laughs> that's, and that's what's happened. And I've gone with that. And I'm quite happy to um, get on board with hating Muslims and South Asian people in general. So I was I was delighted to see this poster. Um, this gave me, you know, this, this I think makes me feel that I can express my Islamophobia a bit more. I might start going back to Labour Party meetings. Um, I feel like I don't have to hide that anymore. Um, Starmer's given me, I guess, a sort of go ahead. You know, it's sort of like Proud Boys stand by kind of thing. And so I just want to say to any Labour members who are out there who might be in doubt, it's very clear, right? And I'll, I'll break it down exactly how it works. So you look at this post and you think, okay, he's talking about the Tory party, he's talking about the Tory leader, but Sunak hasn't actually done anything around this issue particularly. So why wasn't this argument, why wasn't a poster made about Boris Johnson, for example? Why is it being made about Richie Sunak? And so it got me thinking, well, what does Keir Starmer think about Richie Sunak? Like what's one of the main things? So I looked back at the first time they did Prime Minister's Question Time, the first time really Starmer sort of publicly spoke to Richie Sunak and about Richie Sunak. And to quote, this is what he said, may I welcome the prime minister? The first British Asian prime minister is a significant moment in our national story. Significant moment, Asian prime minister. So that's what he thought 
That's what he decided to say. Uh, so clearly that's important to Starmer. It's significant, significant moment. And uh, then he's made this poster. And of course, at the same time, what's going on generally in the UK is around the time this poster came out, there's been a lot of discussion about South Asian grooming gangs targeting underage girls. And so you can see, you can see what Starmer's doing here. And, you know, he might say, there's no place for Islamophobia. Of course, he's got to say that. But, you know, I'm hearing the dog whistles. I'm reading you loud and clear, Starmer. I've been speaking to other Labour members and, you know, we all agree we're all here to foster Islamophobia in the Labour Party or, or South Asian racism in general. You know, it's all good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm up for it all, you know. But I know for a lot of people, this is quite alienating. People that aren't so engaged in politics as me, you know, they don't want to <laughs> continuously... Uh, find a, a racial group or religious group and hate hate on them. That's what politics is all about. For a lot of people, you know, maybe they do want to get involved, but they just don't have time, you know, to go to meetings to to organize a grassroots level <laughs> the sort of hatred that uh, that they want to espouse. Um, other people, you know, they're they're not so interested. Uh, they've been turned off. People have grown cynical of politics. They they hear the racist rhetoric, but they think, well, nothing's going to be done. Are we actually going to physically attack these minorities and you know it rarely happens so i can understand from their point of view but other other people of course um actually disagree with this they they don't like the hard left position of keir starmer and the authoritarianism which goes with that of course um you know starmer very much in the vein of of other hard left leaders like joseph stalin he's all about uh controlling who can be in the party purging people um, destroying other factions, other power bases, getting rid of the former leader, for example, classic kind of hard left authoritarian, which is exactly what Starmer is. And then, of course, on the other side, you've got Richie Sunak, who is a hard right libertarian. He's all about low taxes and fucking children. So it's difficult. It's difficult if you're just a centrist, you're just a kind of normal person in the middle and i think a lot of people they wonder why can't we why can't we have a, a compromise position right and what's interesting about that is well we can have a compromise but it's not where you think it is it's actually right at the other end so there's this thing called horseshoe theory right which is that when you get to the extreme ends of both the left and the right they actually start to look alike and you can see this in the extreme positions of starmer and sunak you can see actually when you get an extreme hard right government, like the one we've got under Sunak, it actually starts to bend towards the authoritarianism of the left. Similarly, of course, the hard left position of Starmer starts to look quite similar to the position of Sunak. So you can see there's a lot of consensus on really crazy things, not taxing the rich, not funding the NHS, not nationalizing the utilities, it's quite a remarkable thing. It's what's known as extreme centrism. Because let us not forget that Nazi means national socialist. So they were nationalist in the same way that Richie Sunak's conservative government is, but they were socialist in the same way that Keir Starmer's hard left authoritarian Labour Party is. Now, obviously, they were anti Semitic and Labour Party used to be anti-Semitic and now it's Islamophobic. But let's not forget the Nazis were also Islamophobic. You know, they were just more ambitious. They were further along than the Labour Party. The Labour Party sort of going from one to the other. But, you know, hopefully a little bit of ambition, they can combine the two. Uh, and that's what I think, you know, <laughs> we'll see when we're streeting this government. But getting back to the poster, what was interesting, and Aaron Bastani posted this on Twitter many years ago, Emily Thornbury actually had a public row with Keir Starmer. A fierce dispute has erupted between the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP Keir Starmer QC, and the Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury, over the use of specially trained prosecutors in rape cases. The Labour MP claims victims could be deprived of expert legal support because of savings made in hiring specially trained barristers. Of course, the reason the guidelines changed was because of austerity. However, Starmer didn't just go along with it, he defended it. And so I've made my own poster. I think this pretty much sums up British politics at the moment. You can have uh, either Richie Sunak's position or you can have Keir Starmer's position. Neither of them are good, but Labour's is better, right? Labour's is a better position. So 
You know, that's why I'm a Labour member. Always vote Labour. <laughs> Always vote Labour. Unless you live in a Labour stronghold, in which case, you know, why even fucking bother? Actually thinking about it, if you simply want the Tories out, but you don't want this particular hard left authoritarian Labour Party to have a massive majority, then you might want to look a bit closer at the polls towards election time and weigh up your options. It might be best actually to vote for another party and see if we can get some kind of minority government or coalition going. Cause I think that would probably be better, right? Also, of course, it was austerity that was the main problem. Uh, but, you know, if Labour aren't actually going to be an anti-austerity party, then the problem still stands. Thank you so much for watching another edition of No News is Good News. If you like this channel, why don't you sign up to the Patreon? Here are some people that have signed up a long time ago. It's still, remarkably, they're, they're still paying month by month. You've probably forgotten that they've actually signed up. But, but, but in all seriousness, I would like to say, in all seriousness. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, sticking with this channel. And uh, I, I don't want to make any promises, but more videos. That's what's needed, right? Oh, yeah.